It was the most partisan session I ever saw. And I got called out quite a few times by the Democrats for pointing that fact out. Jim Wheeler is the deputy minority leader, hopefully majority next time. And he's going to talk a little bit about what happened in 217 for about five minutes. He'll represent all of them. Go ahead, Jim. Well, it won't take five minutes. <laughs> we lost. Um, actually, we had a better than expected session, in my opinion, as far as being almost in a super minority. We were one vote away from a super minority. Our caucus was able to hold together on most issues uh, when we called for a uh, caucus no on something or a caucus yes on something. We were able to really hold together on that uh, most of the time and be able to block a lot of uh, very bad bills from coming through. And you'll see Assemblywoman Tolls brought uh, these flyers that were put on your table and you can see uh, some of the things that we did block and how many we were able to, let me see, I saw one here. Uh, I think it was like 130 bills or something that we were able, I'm not sure it's on there somewhere, 130 pieces of Democrat legislation uh, from the national left wing agenda that they brought before us that uh, we were able to block. So it, it wasn't as terrible as it could have been. But let me start out by saying that I've never seen a session that was as partisan as this session. And the thing that really bothered me about it more than anything was the fact that the uh, public relations arm of the Democrat Party, otherwise known as the mainstream media, kept telling everyone how nonpartisan this session was, just putting out the party line. Now, when first house passage came, uh, the first house deadline came, in the assembly, 8% of Republican bills made it through first house passage, 8%. In the 2015 session, when we were in the majority, I believe it was 42% of Democrat bills made it through that first house passage. So don't sit there and tell me this isn't a non, this is a nonpartisan uh, session. It was the most partisan session I ever saw. And I got called out quite a few times by the Democrats for pointing that fact out. Uh, but if you guys know me, you know that I'm not afraid to say what's on my mind. So I hope that in the next session, we'll be able to get this kind of information out to the public to see what happened in this session and some of the bills that we blocked. Some of, you know, we, like I said, we were playing defense on a lot of things. And if you look at this list, you'll see that we were able to block some of the criminal reforms is what they called them. Uh, we had a lot of different names for that. Uh, we used to walk around the building and uh, those of us in judiciary, and I think there's four of us sitting right here that were on judiciary. We'd just walk into the room and say, well, who are we going to let out of jail today? It's a good day to be a criminal in Nevada, things like that. So some of the, quote, criminal reforms that they did were uh, pretty draconian, but we were able to block most of the draconian stuff there. But some did get through. Okay, uh, business regulations. There were a lot of anti-business bills. Thankfully, the governor vetoed most of those. Uh, so, you know, he pretty much had our back on a lot of this stuff. If we were a caucus no on something, he would uh, veto it probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10. So uh, also anything that rolled back the 2015 gains that we made, such as construction defect, uh, prevailing wage, uh, some of the union bills, et cetera, he vetoed anything that was going to roll back that. So thank goodness we had a Republican governor. Please make sure we have a good, solid Republican governor in 2018. Okay. Adam Waxall comes to mind. Okay. Um, there were education bills. Of course, one of our priorities was education. And we lost on our biggest priority, the ESA is getting the ESA funding but we're able to eke out about $20 million going to the opportunity scholarships. I kind of found, found this a little bit ironic. I was gonna say funny, but it was, it's not funny. But uh, we wanted 60 million, of course, for the ESAs. And uh, 
they ended up making a deal at one time, the Democrats did, to fund the ESAs, and then they went back on the deal right before a floor session for the Senate. Just went back on it. That's why you saw the senators walk out that day uh, about a week before the session, because the Democrats just went back on a deal that was already made on a handshake deal. So anyway, we ended up not getting it, but we got 20 million to the opportunity scholarships, which is a voucher, by the way. When you go get an opportunity scholarship, they give you a voucher to take to private school. So the uh, PR firm of the Democrats, otherwise known as the mainstream media, went out and told everybody how they defeated vouchers. Well, ESAs are not vouchers. They're education savings accounts. And the opportunity scholarship that they put 20 million into are vouchers. So I don't know how they defeated vouchers, but again, it's all in how it's presented. Uh, there were also an education bills. Uh, we defeated a few bills that were uh, going to expand sex education quite a, uh, by quite a bit. One of them, if I remember correctly, uh, Ira, I think you remember this one. It, it came up in 2015 or 2013 as well, uh, where they, no, thank you where they wanted to um, uh, have Planned Parenthood come in and teach sex, sex education. Okay, that got defeated. There were a lot of bills like that. We defeated the minimum wage bills, or actually the governor vetoed the minimum wage bill. However, they were smart enough to know that that was going to happen, so they did pass a resolution that will put a minimum wage bill before the public in the uh, uh, 28, or was that a constitutional change on that one, Joe? On the end. Yeah, that was a constitutional change. So it'll have to come back in the next session, get voted on again, and then it'll go before the public. So if you give us a Republican majority this time, and Washoe County is going to be that swing county again, if you give us a Republican majority this time, we can stop that. Okay. Um, there were quite a few union reform bills. Most of them got defeated. The um, A couple of the ones that came out were just nasty, and most of them came from Jill Dickman's opponent, Skip Daly, who wanted to add $1,600 for every new permit, that they're, uh, for every new house, every, I mean, it was incredible, that was one of his bills. Another one was a very anti-Tesla bill. Uh, he was just trying to get back at Tesla for not using enough uh, union there. So that one, you know, we got to make sure Joe gets back in, guys. We really miss her up there. The, she's been rated the number one and number two conservative by MPRI and ACU during her tenure. And uh, we need that back again. So I hope you guys will help Jill a lot. Uh, prevailing wage. So prevailing wage bills. There were quite a few prevailing wage bills. Uh, we were able to block most of those. They tried to walk back the reforms we did on prevailing wage in 2015. And anything that got through us, the governor did veto. So I'm going to move this on now. Uh, I think my five minutes are about up. So uh, where do we go from here, Cole? Give each each panel member five minutes. The way we're going to do it now is questions from the that were developed by the men's club which 40% are women, by the way, uh, to ask them. And it's not going to be a time limit. If some of them can't answer or don't want to or we're just repeating each other, that's fine. And Jim forgot to mention one of the panel members couldn't make it today because they're fighting fires. And that was a Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Assemblyman John Ellison was supposed to be here today, but he is up in Elko. I'm sure you've all heard about the Elko fire. They've already lost somewhere, I think, 12 to 20 homes up there. And Assemblyman Ellison is being Assemblyman Ellison. He's going to put everybody else above himself. And he's out there actually helping to uh, evacuate families and uh, livestock because he's got trailers. And so he's sorry he couldn't make it today. All right. With this in mind, and... We'll alternate between the questions. Cole's going to ask questions we've developed. And then the ones, if you want questions from the audience, you need to write them down. Cole will collect them. Or Eugene. By the
I could. Oh, okay. I'll let each introduce. Jim, why don't you start? Okay, now that I've spoken. Um, <laughs> All right, you're done. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. I'm Jim Wheeler, Deputy Minority Leader. Hello, my name is Lisa Krasner, and I am the Assemblywoman representing Assembly District 26. And it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Ira Hansen, representing Assembly District 32. Thank you, Assemblywoman Jill Tolles, representing District 25. Such a pleasure to be here. Assemblyman Jim Marchand from uh, representing District 37 in Las Vegas, and I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the invite. I'm Al Kramer. I represent District 40, which is Carson City and a strip of uh, Washoe County from Geiger Grade on the East and East Lake Boulevard area. Really want to welcome all of them here. We appreciate them being here. Cole, are you ready for the questions? We're slightly behind, but considering it's going pretty good. We will alternate. I think we'll start. So You're now to our question. All right, so let's just start with one person. Like every person gets to yeah, we start with Al and then move the way down. So our first question from the board, and then we'll basically what we'll do is we'll pick one of you guys up there to start, and we'll just allow each person to answer the question, and we'll try not to make it the same repetitive order. But the first question is what is the state going to do to handle Medicaid with the upcoming new health care regime? Um, Assemblyman Kramer, would you care to begin? When, when our governor um, accepted the, uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act in the form that it came to Nevada, where uh, the subsidies for people with health insurance was paid for through Medicaid, um, and the federal government reimbursed us at the 90% level for doing that for the first couple of years, and then that percentage rate goes down, it kind of left one of those balloon payments that you get on mortgages hanging out in our future. And, uh, and now with the Affordable Air, uh, Care Act being revised potentially in Washington, where uh, even that reimbursement rate that we've had in the past is going to go away, and that, that that balloon payment's going to be even sooner than, than otherwise. Uh, it, it, makes, it, it makes a big unfunded liability for Medicaid in the state of Nevada for, uh, for health insurance. And, and either, folks, either there's going to be, you know, we're talking a billion bucks here. There's either going to be a heck of a tax increase to cover that, or there's going to be a drop in coverage for uh, uh, this Affordable Care Act, and, 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 and somewhere that's going to meet. And I'm hoping that when, uh, uh, that when they, those, those smartest 100 guys in, in Washington vote on this thing, that they come up with a package that uh, uh, perhaps gives a little more guidance and, and, uh, and, and says that people should pay some of their own insurance and it shouldn't all be paid out of the public uh, taxpayer's pocket. And, uh, and we go from there. But uh, Medicaid is, is a big problem coming up and it's... Uh, it, I don't know where the money is going to come from if they if they commit if Washington commits us to paying that in the future, you can look for tax increases. Assemblyman Marshall. Uh, for the record, if uh, I had been in charge, I would have never accepted it in the first place, and um, <clears throat> because of what Al just said, uh, it it uh, requires us to uh, fund it after they take it away. It's kind of like a crack dealer. They give you crack at first, and then they take it away, and what do you do? Somebody's got to pay for it, and that's going to be us, the taxpayers. So I, uh, I ditto what Al said. So, Thank you. Assemblywoman Jill Tolls. 
Thank you. Well, this certainly is a situation that's changing by the hour, even uh, up to the news this morning. And so it's really hard to predict exactly what the playing field's going to look like when you don't even know what the ball is that you're playing with and where it's going. But um, I would say that, you know, I think that uh, we absolutely need to recognize that there are, there are some that of our most vulnerable population that need coverage, but that's not what we're dealing with here um, in its entirety. We have some able-bodied individuals that are, um, you know, that need to be contributing and not just, uh, as, as Al said, um, not just having taxpayer subsidy for their health insurance. They need to be uh, participating in that program. So um, we're, we're keeping watching it uh, by the hour and, um, and we'll see what we end up with um, to take a look at what we need to do on the state level. Assemblyman Hansen. Thank you. Actually, before I get to that, I left on everybody's table a button, M-A-G-A. Everybody, does anybody know what that stands for? Make America Great Again, all right? We need to start defending President Trump, and we need the Republican Party to get behind him. This is a classic issue that we're talking about right now. So I, I want everybody to put that button on, because people go, what the heck is MAGA? Uh, now you can, well, guess what? I want to help make America great again, and we need to defend the president, because frankly, as Mr. Wheeler pointed out, he is getting attacked mercilessly by the media and by, frankly, the rhino wing of the Republican Party. You know, those guys are out to sink his ship, and if he goes down, the Republican Party in Nevada goes down with him. I got news for you. Anyway, back to this. That goes back to the 2011 session, uh, my freshman year. Interesting, we had a conservative governor at the time, and this whole thing was a brand new idea, and every single legislator, even the most conservative ones, voted for SB 440. It was a 90-10 split at the time. Now, just so you know, that 10%, that's $2 billion. So when we start talking about, now keep in mind, our entire state budget's about $8 billion. That means if we go to 80-20, that's a $4 billion hit for the state of Nevada. It's a huge, huge mess. What we need to do is exactly what President Trump said he was going to do, repeal Obamacare, and let's get the government completely out of it. We have 14 counties in Nevada, in spite of affordable care, that they have, now, they have no access at all to health care because their policies have been dropped, because there's no way for a private insurer to make a nickel on it. And everybody here who's in business knows, has, has, this, been, has this actually made uh, health care more affordable? Have you seen your premiums go down? Have you seen your deductibles go down? How you, do you get to use your own doctor? Everything, all the promises were made about it have been totally bogus. So what we need to do before this gets even bigger is cut it off now because it's only going to become this massive entitlement program that's going to suck up billions of dollars in Nevada. Thank you, sir. Assemblywoman Krasner. It's kind of hard to follow Ira, but I'll try. Um, Obviously, uh, this is a very important issue. Health care is so important to so many people, senior citizens, veterans, uh, widows and orphans. Um, but we do have to be careful that we're not overburdening our budget. Um, we have to be careful that we don't see massive tax increases on hardworking taxpayers. One piece of good news is that um, AB 374, which was a bill titled Medicaid for All, was introduced by Democrat Assemblyman Mike Sprinkle this session, and it did pass, but the governor vetoed it. So that's the good news. We did dodge a bullet on that one when Governor Sandoval vetoed AB 374. Thank you. Assemblyman Wheeler. Uh, the Medicaid problem is obviously a big problem that we've been looking at uh, ever since our current governor signed us up for the uh, Obamacare uh, package, shall we say, the um, website. The numbers that we see or that we have seen in, the la in this last session is this is actually going to cost us about a half a billion a year by the year 2021 if it continues on the way it is. But regardless, if um, we lose, if they completely re repeal Obamacare or not in this next, uh, coming up in this, in this next week or so, or coming up in the next couple of years, the problem is that we've already given this money out 
to people that it was never intended to be given to. You know, as we know, Medicaid is made uh, was put in for the poor and the indigent, and now we're get, now we're, basically what we're doing is expanding expanding the definition of poor and indigent. So, once you give someone something like a Sonia Marchant, or should I say, merchant, uh, like your name tag said, so uh, like Jim said down there, once you give it to them, it's very hard to wean them off it. So, what we have to have, if you really want to fix this problem in Nevada is not only backing President Trump, but you're going to have to back your next Republican governor, and you're going to have to make sure you have a good, solid, uh, fiscally solid Republican governor to get in there and fix this thing. It's not going to be done overnight. And oh, by the way, on the 14 counties that do not have uh, insurance, you will have insurance options by September 1st, and that's all I'm going to say about that right at this point. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you guys for that answers to that question. I'm gonna move on to education savings accounts. Um, I, one of you volunteered to take the first question regarding that, Ira. Um, we will uh, start with you then. So the question is very simple. We'll, we'll let you start, but then we'll move to each one of them to follow up. Education savings accounts, what happened and what's the next step? Assemblyman Hanson. <laughs> I probably should let somebody else go. This is a real, real problem for me. Uh, the 2015 session, when the Republicans controlled everything, the best bill, the absolute best bill that came out of that entire session was the education savings accounts. It was, it was our, 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 our crowning glory. Why? Because we literally were, received national recognition for the best, most advanced school choice initiative in the nation. And as everybody here knows, Nevada, in most instances, is ranked 50th in the nation. You know, they used to joke and say, well, thank God for Mississippi. Now they say, thank God for Nevada. Now, if we're going to solve the education dilemma in the state, and there's a half a million kids in the public schools, you got to come up with a school choice initiative because you're never going to have it solved internally when it's totally dominated by the teachers' unions. So what happened with the education savings account? This was our hill to die for. Um, we had a special session for a football stadium where we came up with $750 million. I think it was two weeks after the Nevada Supreme Court said the ESAs are okay, but they cannot be funded through the distributive school account. You got to come up with a different funding mechanism. I made a huge stink about it saying, here's our chance, guys. We have majorities in both houses. Everything's Republican. Now, while we got a special session going, let's raise the money. We, need, we had the money. Everything was there in place. Well, um, behind the scenes, finally what they did is they brought in to our caucus, Scott Hammond, great guy, senator from Clark County, the author of the ESAs, and he told us all, because he knew where I was, that I was rabble rousing trying to get this done in the session. He said, Ira and everybody, I just want you to know that the governor has given me his word. This will be the highest priority in the next legislative session, so I'm going to take the governor at his word. Don't worry about it. It's going to happen. And I said, you're smoking crack, you're drinking the Kool-Aid, and whatever. So what happened during the session? I will say our caucus, all 15 of us, were 100% on board to do whatever it took to make sure that we got the ESA program, as did the Senate. The Senate also was. And like three days before the end of the session, to our horror, the governor makes a public announcement that he's not going to hold up the budget process to, to, to ensure we get the ESAs. So I actually ran to Hammond in the, in the elevator. Scott, what the heck's going on? So the governor just threw us under the bus. you got to be kidding me. This is our hill to die for. This is the thing we've been promised everybody, our, our, our moment of glory from the last session. So it was, it's a real, real problem. Now we do have the education, I mean, the, we do have the opportunity scholarship program. That, that's the example I gave is we had, frankly, the ESAs was like a Mercedes Benz and the Opportunity Scholarship Program is like a Volkswagen from 1965 with 300,000 miles on it. It's going to last one year. It's not bad. It's, it's better than nothing, but it's nothing close. Last year, 550 kids were involved with the Education Savings Accounts Program. So, the, you know, it, it, it's, it's a real problem for me because of all the things in the whole session, that was without a doubt the most disturbing uh, defeat for the Republicans. <laughs> Assembly of Marchand, want to go? Hard to follow, Ira. But uh, ESAs was the the bill that uh, that if I had to pick one to die for, that was a, that was my passion. 
Uh, how many do you, as does everybody know what ESAs are, education savings account, anybody don't know? Uh, I think that that was the best law, like I said, that we passed in, in 2015. It's the first opportunity we really get to start making a difference in our education system. And why is that? Because we get to introduce a free market uh, option to education. It would allow parents to pull out, pull their kids out of failing schools and send them to a private school and get some of their tax money that they paid in back to do it. And a lot of the argument was, well, the, the $5,100 or $5,700 that uh, was going to be allowed, uh, the parents could take out, uh, is not enough to pay for a private school. Well, you're right. But once you introduce a free market uh, into the system, you're going to have companies that come in and build private schools and and you're going to be able they're going to lower the price with competition and allow parents to send their cool, uh, kids to a private school so like i said uh, governor sandoval invited me in his office early in the session he said what's your bill to die for without hesitation i said esas and he looked me straight in the eye and said we're going to get that done so he flat out lied to me and uh, i was furious at the end of the session when uh, first when he took um, we're not going to have a special session that was our first leverage piece that we could have used and then um, we had a capital improvement bill that had about three or four hundred million dollars i think it's that worth of union projects in it and he took that off the table by uh, lo personally lobbying two senators to go back uh, after they all voted against it he went and lobbied them and, and uh, asked the Democrats to bring it up again, and they voted uh, for it that time. And uh, so we lost our leverage there. So uh, what, there was a bill that, uh, and this is how mad I was, he tweeted, uh, well, I guess we're gonna have to find, uh, see how the assembly votes to see who sold us out and I was so mad, I tweeted back. I said, no, we don't have to see how the assembly voted. We know who sold us out. And it was our uh, leadership right at the top. And so they, they got a little mad at me for that. And I got to tell a little story. When I was doing it, doing the tweet, I walked over to the IRS. I said, should I do this? <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, yeah, go ahead and do it. Of course, his name's not on it. So anyway. Thank you, sir. Can I just add a, a, a few things about the ESAs before we move on? So it was my freshman session, and what was frustrating for me was at the beginning of the session uh, when we had the executive budget laid out and um, Governor Sandoval proposed $60 million for ESAs um, and that it was going to come out of a separate funding source. I thought, this is a win-win, and um, here we have enough money to, to come in from the side, to get this kickstarted, to get it going, uh, to get some money in the coffers, to give students and families choice. Whether it's a student that's been bullied and they just need a, a reset and a new environment or a student that's being recruited into a gang and they need to get out of that school so that they can get somewhere where they can focus on their studies or students that with autism who can go to a specialized school down in Vegas that uh, specializes in autism or just the free market principles that Assemblyman Marchant was, was speaking to, to be able to introduce competition into the market and, uh, and raise all boats. And uh, if you look at the numbers, if you actually crunch the numbers that were enrolled in uh, the last biennium, we had 456,520 students in schools across the state. And you take that 60 million of our biennium, that would really open the door for 1%. We're not talking about a massive amount of, of programs here, of ESAs, it was, it was just a start that was going to hopefully grow over time. But what you heard from the other side, I think it really revealed how far they stretch and exaggerate that this was going to completely uh, dismantle our public schools as we know it, that this was, and, and some of us say, good, you know, that's, we need that competition, right? But the, but the level of fervor I mean, I had all of us, I'm sure, I had um, constituents 300 letters stacked high because we had Democrats walking around my district, knocking on doors, getting signatures because ESAs were going to just completely destroy our, our schools and, and ruin people's lives and so on and so forth. And I thought, 
how far did they are willing to go to be um, unreasonable, to exaggerate? How frustrating is that uh, for us when when we were doing something that that really would make a tremendous difference? in the lives of a child. You know, if you took that money and you redistributed it to all of that 456,520 students, it would have been $36 per kid. That wouldn't move the needle on public education, but that would absolutely change the life of a child who needs to get out of a school into a new option for them. And, um, and I was frustrated that uh, there wasn't that level of reasonableness to, to allow this program to succeed. That's all I have to say. Assembly and Wheeler. Yeah, the first thing I wanted to say is I noticed Eugene down there with Jill going like this. And I just wanted to let you know for 120 days in our caucus meetings to Jill, I was going. <laughs> We've got a little joke about that. That's kind of an inside joke. But the, uh, uh, one of the things you need to know about it was the mechanics of it and what happened. When the only bill that we had to hold up the session was the CIP the bill, the Capital Improvement Bill. And originally we all voted against it and of course the bill failed well as jim and ira both said the governor came back and got the votes well what could have happened had we done this correctly um that could have gone back to the uh to the governor or i mean the governor actually would have had to call a special session to balance the budget because our constitution says the uh, budget must be balanced if he calls that session he gets to set the agenda and the time of the session so he would call it for, okay, you've got to do ESAs and the CIP, and you got three days. The other way to do it would be for the legislature to call the session. And if the legislature calls it, that means you need two thirds of the legislature to actually call the session. And it goes for 20 days, no matter what, and there is no agenda. So it's like having a 20 day session. So had they voted, uh, had they voted that CIP bill out and unbalanced the budget, then the governor refused, refusing to call a special session and setting the agenda for that session, that means pretty much by the Constitution, the legislature would have had to call it. Well, that means we would have got another 20 days of bills, all kinds of bills. And, of course, the ESAs wouldn't have even been included in it. So... We got kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place on this. I just want to let you know the mechanics of it. When the governor did not call a special session uh, for the ESAs, then that is actually what kind of threw the whole thing under the bus there. So let's get a good, strong Republican governor, please. Assemblyman Kramer. I wanted to add one thing to this. When, when, when the Republicans had their negotiations as, as leadership in the Senate, let's take the Senate because that's where the real nuts and bolts of that was going down. It wasn't like we said, we got to have this and we're, we're not going to take a, a step less than that. We went a long way. We, we wanted it universal to begin with for everybody. And we said, well, now, wait a minute. Okay, so we'll have a, a lesser amount based on income and we'll, the less you make, the more you can get. We'll graduate a little bit. And there were a couple of concessions given to say, all right, let's make this a little bit more palatable to the, to the Democrats that were, that were negotiating this. And so there were, and finally they got a handshake agreement to do that. And that's, and that's following that that the Senate walked out. But it's not like we were, you know, just hard, one solid face. And there were concessions that many of us wouldn't have agreed to that were put forward that says, here's what we got to do to make this thing pass. And the Democrats gave a, let's do it, and then they backed off on it. So I, I think the message here is, well, besides the fact you can't trust them, the, the message is that, that we were willing to negotiate to get this, to get something passed, and it wasn't, it wasn't accepted. Thank you, sir. Someone Krasner? Thank you. Um, most of what I had to say has already been said, but I will say this. Every Republican assembly member at this table and in our assembly caucus wanted ESAs. We went into the session in agreement that we want ESAs. The problem is we were in the minority. And when you're in the minority, you cannot get past a two-thirds majority vote on anything that's a tax increase or a fee increase. So that was the problem. We did get the Opportunity Scholarships funded at $20 million. It's not quite as bad as a rickety Volkswagen, like Iris said. Um, 
But the real problem was we were in the minority. We need to work hard together to get Republicans elected. We need to get back to the majority is what we need. Then we set the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So the, just to keep in line with our time constraints, the board's going to ask one more question, and then we're going to move on to your audience submissions. Um, so our que last question from the board will be, what is your view on mental health funding and how will the coming federal changes to health care funding affect that program? Do you have a recommendation? Um, do we have a volunteer to start off? Well, just mental health funding. I don't want to fund the Democrats anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Any volunteers to start off? Demon With the Someone passage calls. of a recreational marijuana, we're going to see a lot more need. <laughs> Anybody else want to follow up on it? No? All right. Then we will, let's uh, go to our final question then, since we have a little bit more time than I thought. All right. This is going to be regarding marijuana taxation. The question is pretty simple. Has marijuana taxation met the forecasted goals? Any volunteers to start off? Assemblyman Wheeler. Well, obviously, we haven't had a year yet, so you know the, the forecast is over the year. But in the first month, it's exceeded the goals drastically, and uh, it's even caused a declaration of emergency <laughs> in order to get the pot to the dealers, which is just amazing to me. But um, I don't know if you know if you know the story on this or not. But the, when question two passed in the question or in the uh, initiative was the fact that the alcohol distributors had to be the pot distributors. They were the ones who would do the actual distribution. And that's in the question itself. Um, when the Department of Taxation wrote the regulations after it passed, they said that it could be distributed pretty much by anybody, which was against the petition. The alcohol distributors took it to court the court ruled in favor of the alcohol distributors. The Department of Taxation has appealed that, but there is no, you know, the appeal hasn't gone through yet. But in the meantime, it has to be alcohol distributors that do it. So a lot of the big alcohol distributors didn't want to do it because they're afraid of losing their federal license, seeing as how marijuana is still a Schedule I drug at the federal level. And so some of the smaller guys were jumping in and they were, were ready to uh, start distributing it, but apparently not at a rate fast enough to keep up with all the pot smokers out there. So that's where it stands now, but in the, uh, the governor had to declare a state of emergency to get the pot delivered, which I just find amazing. And uh, that's, you know, that's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen, but the, as far as the revenue is, yes, so far, they have exceeded expectations from what I understand, rough number by about 30%. Thank you, sir. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. Sure, I'll go next. Um, I represent Assembly District 26, and the people in my district are conservative Republicans. They did not want recreational marijuana legalized. Uh, I fought hard to stop recreational marijuana from being legalized. And we all represent different assembly districts, so we all voted differently on that. But as far as every single bill that came before me in the legislature, except for one, I voted no on every one of them. The one that I did vote yes on was because they accepted my amendment, and my amendment was for uh, the packaging, and every single marijuana product must be labeled with in bold all uppercase print, this is a marijuana product. I don't want marijuana candies and lollipops and suckers and chocolate bars getting in the hands of kids. You know, can you imagine your kids or your grandkids going trick or treating and it's not labeled? So I was adamant about that when I said I'll vote yes on this one bill regarding advertising if you put this amendment in there, and that was my amendment, this is a marijuana product, and that will be on every marijuana product uh, that is made in this state or given to people or uh, put up for sale in this state. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. 
I actually, this is an interesting one because it actually ties in also to the ESAs because um, what has been mentioned is the marijuana taxation bill itself was one of the ones we were going to vote no on in order to forward because the Democrats wanted it was estimated 60 million bucks. So several of us here still ended up voting against it. Well, frankly, if they, I, I tax the hell out of marijuana, that'd be fine with me. It's one of the few taxes I'd like to see them dramatically expand and then uh, reduce the amount that we're being forced to pay in the commerce tax. You know, offset things a little bit. I also want to say we got to we got to say a special thank you to Christopher Dare and Charlene Bybee for voting no. It was a three to two vote on the Spark City Council on recreational marijuana. So I want to thank them uh, them for that. My understanding, the original question though about the revenue is Colorado. It's come up a long term. Obviously, it's a new thing. There's a euphoria about it. Um, but my understanding is in Colorado, it's fell substantially below, and the costs associated with enforcement has uh, dramatically expanded that the amount of illegal activity in Colorado actually went up, not down. And there are very good reasons that the law enforcement communities in Nevada were so aggressively opposed to this. So, you know, I think we just made a huge mistake, a huge Pandora's box has been opened. And if we really truly want to stop drug use or at least reduce it, the idea that we're going to legalize it, make it even less expensive and make it to where it doesn't have any stigma anymore. I don't think that's going to end up help helping our kids or, or our future at all. So no to marijuana. Thank you, sir. Would anybody else like to? Someone told. I just want to add to that. Uh, to he's absolutely right that the skyrocketed rates of accidents on the roads, public safety issues, danger to children, danger to pets, even right, uh, the dropout rates in high school, the impact, the negative impact on social services has been documented, and we're going to see that continue to increase. That's why I opposed it. 46% of our state also opposed it. We have to remember that. And um, and so I uh, I also voted against the uh, the taxation because it was going to put us at the bracket of 32.5%. And what they found in Colorado is that when it got beyond the margin of 28 to 30%, that it actually increased the black market because it priced it out. And so I have some some still extremely uh, high concerns about the issue and uh, and even the taxation of it and the bracket that we put it in, which is why I voted no. Thank you, ma'am. Our president, uh, Mr. Rocha. Yeah, before we get into the audience questions, I wanna acknowledge a couple of people who are a little late getting here. The first one is Carolyn Cambabonso. She's president of the Washoe Republican Women. Stand up. <laughs> the other person is Marion Bond. She's past president of the Reno Republican Women. Stand up. <laughs> Eugene Hoover is also, I forgot to mention, on our board. And they're going to start asking questions. But the real brain on the outfit with all the Hoover clan is Jolene. Stand up, Jolene. <laughs> With one last thing, somebody left on the counter their cell phone. Somebody left a cell phone. If you're missing a cell phone, I have it up here. Are you, okay, I'll have it up here and we'll get it. I need a new one. Yeah, you need, Jim needs a new one. You lost out. Anyway, anyway, Cole and Eugene are going to start questions that came from the audience in writing. Call you and Eugene take over. Assemblyman Kramer, did you have a, a follow-up last statement you wanted to make with that? Because then we will move on to the next. I think just one thing. You know, the the counties and the cities are the ones left with enforcing these laws on marijuana and, and, and trying to pick up the pieces, especially, as Jill mentioned, the mental health side of it. And really the only income that comes to the cities and counties is if they actually have a sales or, or grow or, or processing facilities in those counties and they get a 3% tax on those. I, and, and I don't see where that's anywhere near enough to cover the cost that that's going to be. The money goes to the state. It doesn't go where the, where the law enforcement problems are going to be. It, there, more work needs to be done on that. Thank you, sir. All right. For time constraints, we're going to move on to audience submitted questions now. Um, Mr. Hoover, you want to go ahead and start or do you want me to? Basically, I want to start, uh, I'm going to pick one legislator from the north, one from the south for the gen general question. You got one from the south. Uh, gotcha. Uh, basically, uh, we have redistricting coming. 
situation. If we're in a minority again, we're going to really have some issues here. Would you comment on what you think that the Republican Party and the state should do and, and down to the county level as to what we should do to work on this issue? Yes, uh, redistricting obviously is a huge issue, and I think that happens in 2020. So it's uh, absolutely critical that we get a Republican governor in 18. It would also be ideal if uh, the Republicans would regain majority in both the Assembly and the Senate. Uh, we have a lot of uh, issues there. It's an uphill battle. Not quite sure how we do it, except for the county parties, I think, need to, to um, help us, uh, the assembly people here, really good candidates uh, in the districts where we can challenge uh, some Democrats. There are districts where uh, we probably won't prevail because the the registration is so upside down in favor of the Democrats. And that's another uh, issue. As uh, many of you know, President Trump has assigned uh, or, or formed a task force to try to clean up the voter rolls. And I think that's important also. We ought to try to do anything we can here in Nevada to help out with that issue because that's, uh, I think we're 100,000 down statewide, I believe, uh, Republicans to Democrats. and. Uh, if, if that's the case, then it's going to be extremely difficult for us to take majority again. So we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm ready to work. Great. Uh, Senator Hansen, if you'd be good enough to comment on this as well, please. Yeah, real quick, I went through I'm, my fourth term. So I was there in 2011 when we had the last redistricting. It can be a real problem. Um, what ended up happen happening is both both parties, basically both uh, Democrats and Republicans, drew districts which, of course, were favorable to themselves. Democrat districts were horrible. <laughs> Republicans were a little more fair. And what ultimately happened was it was forced into the courts. But I am absolutely frightened by it, by it because it takes a two-thirds vote to, to redistrict, okay? I think, if I remember right. If we don't have a Republican governor and we don't have at least one house with a, with a two-thirds minority, we're in a heap of trouble. And then the only thing you can do is take it to like a federal court and claim there's some discrimination or something like that. But it is a, a, a huge issue looming. It won't be in the next session. Uh, we got the 2019 session. It'll be in the 2021 session. So we got one election cycle, but we definitely need to be thinking about it because it, uh, it can really have dramatic impacts on the makeup of the legislature and the congressional district. All right. Um, Assemblywoman Tolls did ask first, so we will get to both of you as well. Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you. One of the reasons that I brought this today was I wanted it to be a good visual reminder because these 41 bills that were vetoed, and then if you can imagine the other 130 bills that we were able to successfully stop even before they got to the vote, uh, all the ones that our, our um, assistant minority leader pointed out that uh, we were able to stop are going to come back as the Christmas wish list in the next session. And if we don't have the seats and we don't have a Republican governor, we will not be able to successfully stop all those. And they will become the law, and that will change the face of our state. And uh, so just take that home with you, show that to your neighbors, Get out there, knock on those doors, get that registration. Let's get uh, Republicans reelected and get new ones elected so that that future doesn't happen. We are up for time, sir. Can we move to the next question and we'll let you, you'll be one of the people to answer? One minute. Okay, just real quick. Yes, you have to get good candidates. Yes, you have to have. Uh, uh, good advertising, et cetera, what it comes down to in the end and where each and every one of you can help is with voter registration and get out the vote. Go out and get people registered. Learn how to get people registered. Turn this county red again, just like your uh, caucus wants to do. Thank you, sir. All right, the next question, we're just going to restrict this to two people. Um, we're going to be asking Assemblyman Tolls and Assemblyman Krasner this question. The question is, can you comment on laptops for felons in prison? What, whoever wants to take it first. So that, that came around twice, came around on the assembly side, assembly bill 420, and then on the Senate side, not sure exactly what the, 
what the number was on uh, on the Senate side, and it, uh, I can't remember which one actually went through uh, to the governors, but uh, it was an interesting vote. We all voted against it on the assembly side at first, and then um, Assemblyman Hansen and I switched our vote on the floor. I sat next to the sponsor, and there were three parts to that bill. Don't have time to go into the, all the details, but two of them were really good, actually, um, something that uh, Assemblyman Krasner had um, identified as a real need. But the one part that was problematic that pr raised a lot of security concerns and other concerns were the iPads part for inmates and so forth. So I talked to the sponsor on the floor and uh, and he said that he would work with me to address that concern. And sure enough, I offered an amendment on the Senate side that he introduced to remove that part on the Senate side. So by the time AB 420 went through the Senate, it actually removed the iPad part um, and kept in the parts that we liked. Thank you, ma'am. Summer Warner Krasner. Thank you. I'm very happy to comment on this because this was a real bone of contention for me. I was um, the assembly minority chair for corrections, parole, and probation, and there were two versions of this. The first one was AB 420, which they watered it down and they made it into just a visitation bill, which we were fine with. They, they brought it back again the last week of the session, and that one was SB 306. That is the iPads for inmates bill that passed. I was adamantly opposed to this bill because it basically allows every felon, and again, if you know what a felon is, it's, it's a serious crime, somebody who has prison time coming. Every felon upon entry gets a free iPad, laptop, or tablet to keep in their cell with them at all times. Now, I have a, a list of problems with this. Number one, it puts our guards at risk. Those prison guards are law enforcement, okay? It puts them at risk. These felons have nothing but time on their hands. Excuse me speaking so frankly. Uh, they sit, some of them are hackers. They can sit there in their cell and they can hack a kid's Game Boy and turn it into an internet device. What are they gonna do with an iPad, laptop, or tablet? They're gonna, first of all, they're gonna have communication amongst themselves, plan an overthrow on the guards and get out of prison free and come kick down your door at four o'clock in the morning. That's a public safety concern right there. And the next thing they're gonna do is they're gonna be able to contact uh, the outside world and put a hit out on the witness that put them behind bars in the first place, another public safety concern. And if they're not doing that, maybe they're just contacting their homeboys and doing drug deals from inside prison walls. Hey, isn't that great? You know, three hot meals, central eating, central heating, central air conditioning, uh, free education, and now they get a free iPad, laptop, uh, tablet to keep in their cell with them. And another thing, we can't give our kids books. Our kids don't have up-to-date textbooks in public schools. That's a dirty little secret I learned in education committee. But we can give an iPad and a tablet to a felon? I don't think so. I had a real problem with this. Uh, I continue to have a problem with it now. I made a floor speech against it. This was the Senate Majority Leader Aaron Ford's bill. Nobody dared speak up against it. It came up the last night on sign die, and I pushed my button and I said, I have something to say. People were a little bit shocked that I stood up and made a floor statement, but the people in my district don't want this. The people in my district care about public safety, and the people in my district have a voice down at the legislature, and it's Lisa Krasner. That was my problem with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So this next question is going to be for all of you. Again, we are cut for time, so we're going to ask you all if you can at least keep it to one minute. Um, we'll start with Assemblyman Wheeler, and we'll just move down the line. The question is, will all of you oppose efforts to repeal or weaken the current marijuana DUI law in future legislative sessions. Can you repeat that? Will all of you oppose efforts to weaken or repeal the current marijuana DUI law in future legislative sessions? I believe everybody on this panel opposed it in this session, opposed anything like that. Um, so yeah, obviously as a ex law enforcement, I would oppose anything that uh, weakens our DUI laws for anything. 
By the way, I've never uh, busted anyone on drugs, by the way, who didn't start with marijuana. So uh, it is definitely a gateway drug. And uh, I really want to thank the two uh, commissioners for voting against bringing it in. I'm lucky enough to represent Douglas Story in Lyon County and in Douglas County. Charlene, just for school for thought, uh, we decided that we would uh, not allow any marijuana dispensaries within 65 miles of a school as in zoning. The county is 65 miles long. Okay. That's other woman Krasner. Yes, I will oppose. Thank you, ma'am. Sullivan Hansen. Ditto. Sullivan Tolls. Absolutely. As a sister of two police officers in California, I've seen what that's done in California. It's, they've continued to decriminalize. And also having a niece who was in, involved, hit by a, a man who was under the influence of marijuana, I absolutely would oppose weakening those laws. Thank you, ma'am. Someone in Washington? I don't need a minute. Yes. All right. Someone in Craig. I'm a little concerned that the DUI law we have for marijuana now isn't specific enough to say when someone is under the influence. I think people can be using marijuana and not test positive to it at the point of check, or at least to a point to where they get pulled over. I think, uh, fortunately, our law enforcement is trained to the point that they can tell when someone's under the influence without having some tests, and I hope our courts back that up. But uh, I'm not for making them more liberal. I'd like to ask the next question here is uh, Jim Marchant, similar. Should big companies receive tax incentives to relocate here when there are other businesses in the same field already paying taxes? Should we give in a tax incentive for those folks? Um, Especially uh, for fish, fish pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say I've been against uh, that from the beginning. I think we have a lot of businesses here that could use a tax uh tax help, and there's a lot more of them here. And I think when we did the deal with Faraday, they were promising like, uh, we're gonna have like 4,000 jobs in 20 years or something like that. Well, the small businesses here in Nevada, they do like 12,000 jobs every year. So why don't we help the local businesses here in Nevada first? Thank you, sir. We'd like to ask for one additional volunteer to take that question. Anybody else willing to? Solomon Hansen. Well, yeah, of course. You know, look, bottom line is we had several bills. The worst one was Faraday Futures, where we made a bunch of promises, but that was based on abatements if they spend a certain amount. That was still a disaster, by the way. The worst one, though, was the football stadium. We spent $750 million of tax dollars, not subsidies, but direct tax dollars to buy a, and create a football stadium to give to a private billionaire. I mean, this isn't even subsidies. This is actually, we are buying, it'd be great. Like my little plumbing company, if I need a new building, I have the government buy the building for me and I, and I lease it back for a dollar a year. And you guys, the government picks up all the tab for anything that costs money and anything that makes a profit, I get to keep. Quite an interesting arrangement. Bottom line is no. The only one that I can think of right now, the North, frankly, is doing exceptionally well financially and economically because of Tesla. Tesla has been an absolute stimulus, and that is an example you're talking about, and I voted for. In fact, every 63 legislators supported Tesla. Big fight over Faraday Futures. Uh, you know, there are four Republicans that voted no on that one. And then the football stadium, I think there are only two Republicans that voted no. I can't remember. Anyway, so it's quite interesting to see because it's really easy to sit here in a room full of Republicans and talk about that, but you'll find when you're in the legislature, especially for people who haven't been there, it is extremely intense pressure. In every single one of those cases that I mentioned, it was the governor's staff and the best lobbyists money can buy because you're talking about billionaires pushing these kind of programs and they don't hear from people like you. In fact, it's kind of a funny thing for all of us. There are almost, what, 3 million people in Nevada now? And if we get 300 emails on a bill, we think it's a huge deal. In other words, if all 96 of us or whatever in this room did that, it would have a dramatic impact on how we as legislators think. So what, guess what, we, we didn't hear from many folks and some people compromised who shouldn't have and it cost them in the elections. But bottom line is no, the, the government should stay out of the private sector, let the business community does, do what it does and let the market determine who comes here and who doesn't. Mr. Marchand is completely correct on that. We've got to get out of that habit because it's getting to be a pattern. We did some solar energy ones where we gave 
exceptionally large amounts of subsidies nobody even knows about yet. So anyway, I've had my one minute. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Please let me Perfect. comment just a little bit. I know we talk about free enterprise and, and how competition should do that, but we don't live in a perfect free enterprise economy. It isn't free competition every place. We deal in, we have 50 states in this country, and it's easy for us to say, it'd be easy to say, well, we're not gonna allow these types of subsidies and bring a Tesla that is positively affecting this area in, to Nevada. But, but think, we don't, we aren't in isolation. We're compete, we, we compete for that business with Texas and Arizona and every other state in the country would like to have that. And there's no federal law that says you can't have these subsidies. And as long as there's no overriding factor that says you can't do something, somebody's going to make that offer and steal that business and take it someplace else. We made an offer for Tesla. And remember, Tesla, with the exception of a small part for a highway, is basically releasing from taxes that we wouldn't have gotten anyway, except for the fact that they came in. It's not like the stadium where we're actually putting dollars out. So sometimes you can make a deal that builds your government up and it looks like a subsidy. And unfortunately, when you do those, you have to make the same rules for everybody who qualifies under the same consideration. And some companies came in into that other than just Tesla. But it's, it's not black and white. You don't, it's not just us in isolation. We're competing against other states for those jobs. And those tax revenues in the futures are going to build this, this state up. So I think there's room for a little difference. Of Thank you, sir. This next question, we're going to try to hit every single person. Um, we'll start with, um, how does Assemblywoman Toll sound? All right. So how do you guys feel about sunsetting most laws or repealing two laws for each one passed? If you disagree with that, we'd also like to know why. That's one of the best things about this forum is it's tough questions. So Assemblywoman Tolls, if you'd begin. Thank you. Yes. Uh... I, uh, I present as a freshman, I got six bills and I got three of them passed unanimously. One got amended into uh, another legislator's bill and that also passed unanimously. But one of my bills that failed was to go through and take some, a whole page of NRS statute that was introduced in 1976 that was anti-competition having to do with uh, taxis and limos, uh, particularly smaller limo companies. and. Um, and that, of course, failed before it even got to a vote. Um, I love the idea of going through and decluttering the closet. I think in just about every um, sector uh, that we deal with, I think that we could do a lot of redlining old legislation that's just no longer relevant or cumbersome regulations that are getting in the way of those free market principles that we fight for. Thank you, ma'am. Assemblyman Marchant. We are regulated to death. I would love to get rid of an enormous amount of the NRS. And one of the things I noticed as a freshman is that we'll pass a law, but it's the boards or the departments that will come up with the regulations that go in NRS. And that's disturbing to me because we're basically passing the law and say, okay, here are the broad parameters but they get to set the specific parameters and most of them are anti-business and I'm a business guy and I'm, I can tell you firsthand that we are over-regulated. I'd love to do something about that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Something McCrim. It, it'd be nice. Uh, I know I submitted, as most of us did here, uh, six bill drafts, but how do you define which one of those bill drafts is new law or removing old law? So a kind of a definition you have to go through right here. I know one of mine had to do with the commerce tax and redefining part of it and saying that if you're a, an LLC or a corporation, you don't have to uh, renew every year in August, but you can renew your commerce tax or pay your commerce or declare your commerce tax exemption when you file your LLC or, or corporate papers. Well, is it, how do you define that? Is that a new law or is that a clarification with an old law? Or does it clarify some things? I think part of it's in the definition there, but, but definitely we've got a lot of laws in the books that need to be simplified and just completely eliminated. Thank you, sir. Uh, Assemblyman Hansen, actually. Uh, how, many, how many of you, out of curiosity, were like excited when the legislature came in and said, oh, good, the Nevada legislature is meeting again? 
Not many, right? Why? Because it, it's an old joke. It's like, yeah, hang on to your wallet. You know, what's going to happen? What laws are they going to mess with? What things am I currently doing that are going to be illegal? Uh, what new taxes am I going to have to pay? It, it, and Jim's point is very valid. As we have the Nevada Revised Statutes, which we pass, but then there's a whole other body of law called the Nevada Administrative Code, the NAC, which carries everybody's, uh, everybody's, uh, every bit as much weight as the full-blown NRSs do, yet they're done exclusively by boards and committees, yet, but they carry the exact same legal weight as the laws that we pass as a legislative body. And I've been involved heavily in that. But anyway, you could get off on that. I, I have to laugh because when you go back to the 1990s, remember when Jim Gibbons had the, the Gibbons Tax Restraint Initiative, and that was to require a two-thirds vote, and that, that frankly that propelled him into the governorship and a Congress, congressional seat. Well, if a really smart politician was out there, especially a Republican one that wanted to run and do something similar, he would recommend that the Nevada legislature meet every five years and you laugh, you laugh, but how many of you think, you know what, we'd be better off if we'd have less regulations, less government, less time down there. You guys have 120 days to basically screw things up. If you'd only make once every five years, you'd screw it up a lot less. And we'll get used to living under the laws you already passed. You laugh, but I'm telling you, there's something to that. Anyway, so I say I agree completely with too many laws and rules, and let's sunset some of them. Thank you, sir. Someone Krasner. Thank you. Um, two words, limited government. This is a Republican principle that we all believe in, right? Limited government, less taxes, less regulations on our businesses. We don't need to over-regulate our businesses and drive them out of the state. For Pete's sake, yes, I am in favor of having fewer BDRs, fewer bill draft requests, but I want to give um, credit to one assemblyman, and it's our own Republican assembly member, Richard MacArthur from Las Vegas, who did bring a bill this session that said that there would be fewer bills brought forward across the board by everybody. His bill didn't even get a hearing. Assemblyman Wheeler, go ahead, sir. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we'd all like to see that, actually. But uh, we do have, uh, there's a mechanics of getting away, and it's always great to sit here and say all the wonderful things you want to hear. But uh, I found out being in leadership in the last two sessions that there's a lot of things that you can do and a lot of things that the way the laws are currently written and the Constitution is currently written, you can't do. So what it would take to do that, I think we'd all like to actually get rid of a lot of these laws. Right now we have something called a Sunset Commission, which goes through, and then it takes a BDR, a bill draft request, to get rid of that law, to change that law. So if you want to make this happen, the way to do it is make a constitutional change. Something that you can do, you can, it can go through an, an initiative petition twice, and then go to the legislature. Let me tell you, after it's passed an initiative petition twice, the legislature is not going to turn it down. So if you want to make a constitutional change that says, for every law that, risk, that is written, two must be repealed. Uh, boy, God bless you, go for it. I'd love to see it happen. But until we get a Republican majority, you're not gonna even get a hearing on anything like that. Thank you so much. Ray, we have one additional question for the audience. Can we get that? We just wanna get right, one. I was person. just gonna tell everybody, it is one o'clock, but if you bear with us, we'll do one question and we'll do the 50-50. And then you'll be able to get with the panel and ask individual questions. And one last thing, Maria Davis is here representing the Latin American Chamber. Stand up. All right, our last question from the audience. Uh, this one was submitted just now. It was with regards to ESAs. We only have time to take it from one person. Um, who is the resident expert on ESAs? All right, all right. Well, why don't you volunteer then? So, has anybody heard of the Blaine Amendment? The question is, why did nobody foresee the Blaine Amendment coming into play? And uh, just it, we, that was the question. So, if we could, if somebody could answer that. The Blaine Amendment was actually passed in typically in most states. It's in our Constitution. It was a, it was frankly a way to prevent c uh, Catholic schools from being financed 
there was a pretty strong anti-Catholic movement in the late 19th century. And that is actually in our constitution. That's what the Blaine Amendment does. And one of the things they've used that to try to prevent all school choice initiatives, basically using that to deny it. But it, it did come up. That was, that was something that was overcome when we passed the ESA. I, and that was, that was part of the challenge that the, the uh, teachers union took to the Nevada Supreme Court. And remember, we won at the Nevada Supreme Court. We won that. So the Nevada Supreme Court said, in spite of the Blaine Amendment in our constitution, this is constitutional to have an education savings program. You simply can't fund it through the distributive school account. All we have to do is come up with a different funding mechanism. So thank you so much, sir. All right, that concludes our audience questions. Uh, Ray Rocha, we'll turn it back over to you. Like I said, you can stay and ask questions because I know there are questions we couldn't get to. And I had some I was going to ask. But before we do, I appreciate everybody being here. We are broadcasting live. Like I said, you can go to republicanmensclub.org and we have our own channel, RMC TV, and we will get over 10,000 that will view it. So if you want to review what was said today, you can listen to it. With that in mind, Carolyn Smith's going to call. You have the mic about the 50 50. Okay, y'all, get your tickets out. Somebody's going to be a winner out there. Senator Willard, will you please pick the winning ticket? Oh, I got promoted. Yeah, you got promoted. <laughs> Senator. <laughs> yeah, it might be a demotion. Can't pick your own. Yes, I can. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> It's hard getting old. I hope I'm going to read this right without my glasses. It's 549-2514. 2514 is the last four digits. Oh, we have a winner. Oh, you're kidding. You win. Uh, um, we collected $100, so you're going to get $50. Thank you. Like I said, I appreciate everybody being here. Our next meeting is going to be on... August 15th, I think. It depends on Congress. We've got to work on them, you know. Um, anyway, with that in mind, feel free. I hope they have a little time that I know there's a lot of questions didn't get a chance to be asked or answered. So come up and ask them questions on any subject, and I'm sure they'll be glad within reason to talk to you. Again, thank you. I hope you had a good meal. Thank you all for having us. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead and, if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. You can go over here, watch a couple more videos, link to our website at republicanmensclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.